The ST45 is a six-axle diesel-electric locomotive that was built by the Electromotive Division of General Motors between 1965 and 1971. A whopping 1,260 were built for American railroads before the electronically superior SD45-2 replaced it. Other variants like the SDP45 and the SD45-2 tunnel motor were also released in the 1970s. I'm Railfan AC and you're watching Trains in the 21st Century. The 645 family of diesel engines was an evolution of the earlier 567 series engines and a precursor to the later 710 series engines. Introduced in 1965 as the 567 series engine had reached its limits in horsepower increases, the 645 series engines remained in production on a by request basis long after the 710 engines had replaced it, with most 645 service parts still in production. In 2005, Caterpillar-owned Progress Rail acquired EMD and the 645 is supported by the now Electromotive Diesel Company to this day. All 645 engines are two-stroke 45-degree V engines. The engine is a uniflow design with four poppet-type exhaust valves in the cylinder head and charge air scavenging ports within the size of the cylinders. All engines use a single overhead camshaft per bank with exhaust valves operated by two cam lobes and one cam lobe to operate the unit injector which is in the center of the four exhaust valves. Cylinders in each V pair are directly opposite each other and since all rods are always in compression the connecting rods use a simple system of fork rods on one bank of the cylinders and blade rods on the other with the same stroke on both banks. As all rods are ultimately in compression or tension throughout all four engine cycles, competitor General Electric in its 7FDL series engine uses the more complex articulated connecting rods that has a slightly longer stroke on the bank with articulated rods. The engines are provided with either a single or twin roots blower, or a single mechanically assisted turbocharger depending on the output that's needed. And just for the record, all of that technical gibberish notwithstanding, these same specifications are also common to many of the 567 and 710 series engines. The engine block is made from flat, formed and rolled structural steel members and steel forgings welded into a single structure known as a weld mint so it can easily be repaired using conventional shop tools. For maintenance, a power assembly consisting of a cylinder head, cylinder liner, piston, piston carrier, and piston rod can be individually replaced relatively easily and quickly. When the 645 engine entered production, a new series of locomotive models was introduced with it. In 16 and 20 cylinder form, the turbocharged version of the 645 was used in the 40 series diesels, specifically the GP40s, SD40s, and SD45s. During this time, EMD also introduced a roots blown 38 series, the GP38 and the SD38, and the turbocharged 12 cylinder 39 series, the GP39 and the SD39. All of these locomotives share extensively common components and subsystems, thereby significantly reducing the cost and increasing the interchangeability of parts. The GP38-2 and the SD40-2 became the most popular models of the series and two of the most popular locomotive models ever built. And now, here's a crash course of how EMD numbered its diesel locomotive models. Starting with the 645 series engines, EMD's model numbering sequence generally increased model designs by 10, such as with the SD40, the SD50, the SD60, and the SD70 series diesels. The number was reduced by 1 for 12-cylinder versions such as the 39, 49, and 59 series diesels. It was reduced by 2 for the roots blown versions, that would be the 38 series, and increased by 5 for the high horsepower versions such as the SD45 and the SD75. The 645 series engines have a maximum engine speed between 900 and 950 revolutions per minute and increase over the 800 to 900 RPMs of the 567 series. When in motion, the engine speed varies depending on the throttle position. The 950 RPM speed of the 645 F engine was too high and compromised its reliability and as a result, it doomed the 50 series locomotives as we talked about in video T146. A link to that video is in the description just in case you missed it. Because of that, the replacement engine, the 710G, reverted back to the 900 RPM maximum speed. EMD also built an SD40 demonstrator diesel that we'll talk about more in detail later in this video. 
For now, in July of 1964, number 434 was field tested with the 16-cylinder 645E3 engine, followed by another 8 SD40 demonstrators numbered 434A through 434H and the GP40 demonstrator numbered 433A in 1965. The SDs were classified as the SD40X. In December of 1965 and January of 1966, EMD built three SD45 demonstrators to field test the 20-cylinder 645E3 engine. It had to be those flared radiators that were like nothing seen on diesel locomotives up to that point. The flares made their way to the DD35As and later would be found on the DD40AX and boxier versions of GEs and EMDs stretching all the way to today. It had a 645 E3 20-cylinder engine that generated 3600 horsepower on the same frame as an SD38, an SD39, an SD40, and an SDP40. As of 2020, most of them have been retired and scrapped. Buyers of the SD45 included the Burlington Northern, Southern Pacific, Santa Fe, the Pennsylvania Railroad, the Great Northern Railway, the Union Pacific, and the Northern Pacific Railway, and there were others. Although some SD45 still exist, most have been rebuilt with 16-cylinder 645s for leasing companies. SD45s and SD45-2s owned by the Montana Rail Link retained their 20-cylinder prime movers. Wisconsin Central rostered a large fleet of SD-45s, but its sale to Canadian National resulted in the retirement of the entire fleet with most of them scrapped. Back in Montana, the rail link is also starting to sell some of its SD-45s for scrap. Contrary to popular belief, the SD-45 was not a gas guzzler, but it did have its problems. Although it produced more power per unit of fuel than its 3,000 horsepower counterpart, the SD40, it also sucked down more fuel when idling than an SD40, which was a problem since U.S. railroads tended to leave locomotives idling when not in use, particularly during the winter months. The SD45 in the Dash 2 was actually more fuel efficient than the SD40 in the Dash 2 in terms of the horsepower per pound of fuel burned but they produce not an ounce more tractive effort at max cruising speed. So if you power just to make the ruling grade, you wind up with more horsepower per ton with the SD45s, which reduces your train's fuel economy in terms of ton miles per gallon. 
What this means is that you may be making horsepower hours a little bit cheaper, but you're spending them a little bit faster. Are you confused yet? Reliability was the real issue. The 20 cylinder prime mover could break its own crankshaft and although it produced 600 more horsepower than the SD40, many railroads just felt that the extra horsepower wasn't worth it. And I can't say that I disagree with them on that. To solve the problem, EMD redesigned the block to reduce the crankshaft flexing and produce the 645F crankcase and crankshaft which formed the basis of the exceptionally reliable 710G engine which is the cornerstone of EMD's locomotives to this day. The SD45 and the SD45-2 were actually very good engines. The choice between a new SD40 and a new SD45 or their Dash 2 successors mostly had to do with the operating paradigms of each railroad. For some railroads, the 40 was the better fit while others favored the 45, and that's just how it went. When it comes to railroads, especially in the 20th century when locomotive types were aplenty, broad generalizations are a bad way to identify the individual preferences of each railroad. Railroads study them in great detail, but they have the tools and information that most of us rail fans don't have to help them make those important decisions. Unless you've actually worked in the industry or have some other first-hand knowledge, it's hard to understand the locomotive acquisition decisions in anything other than the broadest terms. For example, the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy used the red and white gyra lights in the upper housing and standard white fixed lights in the nose on EMDs, and just the opposite on the GEU boats. The Southern Pacific had more SD45s than any other North American railroad, 317 to be exact with another 39 from the Cotton Belt for a total of 356, even dwarfing the Great Pennsylvania Railroad fleet of 130 units who was the Southern Pacific's closest SD45 competitor. The third and fourth place titles went to the Santa Fe who had 125 and the Norfolk and Western who had 115 and in traditional N&W heritage these units were geared to run long hood forward. After that, no other railroad had more than 100 SD45s brand new, but the Burlington Northern bought 96 and inherited 15 from the CB&Q, 27 from the Great Northern, and 30 from the Northern Pacific by way of the Burlington Northern merger. Even our own Delaware and Hudson had three of those 20-cylinder beasts. These units were originally the EMD demonstrators number 4352 to 4354. Known as Hummingbirds, the 45s were swapped to the Erie Lackawanna for three U33Cs, numbers 3301 to 3303. The 45s returned to the DNH after conveyance day and were patched back to the DNH with the Erie Lackawanna's maroon bands painted the DNH blue. All three were sold off to Mexico two years later in 1978, and just for the record, there were actually four SD45 demonstrators that were built, the fourth one going to the Illinois Central as their number 7,000. The eastbound Southern Pacific train that you see here is at Salinas, California on February 5, 1987. Leading is the SD45 number 7566, followed by a Union Pacific SD40-2 and a pair of SP tunnel motors. The yellow and red paint scheme of the 7566 is that of the anticipated but ultimately ill-fated Santa Fe Southern Pacific merger and was called the Kodachrome scheme by rail fans. Kodachrome being a metaphor of the two colors that were prominent on the packaging of that film type that was popular in the 20th century and would outlast both roads into the 21st century. Unfortunately, the Interstate Commerce Commission, which had regulatory oversight of the U.S. railroads at that time, voted the merger down in July of 1986, and the Southern Pacific was sold to the Rio Grande Industries, then the parent company of the Rio Grande, in 1988. A little more SP history is at the far right of this picture. The refrigerator car belongs to the Pacific Fruit Express that was founded in 1907 as a joint venture between the SP and the UP, with the Western Pacific participating between 1923 and 1967. We discussed the PFE and other temperature controlled freight operations in great detail in video T160. Link is in the description. The future of the PFE, of course, is that Union Pacific SD40. In 1996, the SP and its PFE holdings was gobbled up by the UP who'd also acquired the Missouri Pacific, the Western Pacific, and the MKT up to that point. The Union Pacific, which has the oldest major railroad name in continuous use in the U.S., soldiers on to this day. And if CSX and NS keep doing what they're doing over here in the East, it's likely that UP and the Bensef will become East Coast railroads. Only time will tell if I'm right. The SD45X was said to be a test unit for the Southern Pacific and a predecessor to the tunnel motors. They were also the first units to have the new HTC trucks installed. 
AMD even managed to get a whopping 4200 horsepower out of the SD40X, almost identical to the modern SD70s and Dash 9s of today. The rumor is that AMD wanted to market the SD45X as the SD55, but I suppose that extra horsepower was just too much. Even the sales of the standard 36 horsepower SD45 and Dash 2s were drying up in the early 1970s due to the rising cost of diesel fuel. There were seven SD45Xs built between June of 1970 and February of 1971. Six were sold to the Southern Pacific while one, number 5740, was kept by EMD. All of SP's units were disposed of around 1980, only a decade after being built. When they were sold to the SP, the units were tough to maintain since they were different from a standard SD45. The SP tried them out on Donner Pass, but they still ran hot in the tunnels and snowsheds despite the extra cooling fan. They fitted some of them with elephant ears, which had also been tried on some standard SD45s, and it did help the cooling problem by drawing cooler, cleaner air from the walkway level, which ultimately led to the SD45 T-2. After that, the elephant ears came off and the 45Xs lived out the remaining years in the Roseville, California freight pool. The SD45X, in name, was also supposed to be something of a predecessor to the SD50, but as it turned out, that didn't happen until the SD40X was introduced to the Kansas City Southern in 1979 and then the SD50S for the NNW in 1980. The SD50S, short frame, were prototype units built in December 1980. They were shorter than production locomotives by approximately two feet. The six SD50Ss that were built went to the Norfolk and Western as we just talked about and were passed on to the Norfolk Southern. They were withdrawn in the early 2000s as non-standard units with two being rebuilt in 2008 as SD40Es along with several standard length SD50s. The designation SD40X was also given to an experimental version of the SD50 built on an SD40-2 frame. The four that were built were delivered to the Kansas City Southern as KCS number 700 through 703. The Union Pacific's EMD's SD40X units were really SD35Xs as they were built on SD35 frames. We talked about those diesels extensively in video T129. The link is in the description. Great Northern number 400 named Hustle Muscle was the first production SD45 and is preserved by the Great Northern Railway Historical Society based out of St. Paul, Minnesota. Built in May of 1966, the 400 received the Hustle Muscle moniker by Great Northern when the company purchased the unit. It continued to carry the name after it became Burlington Northern number 6430 following the 1970 Burlington Northern merger. In 1986, it was retired and donated in operating condition to the Great Northern Railway Historical Society. In 1989, the unit was repainted to its original Great Northern paint scheme by Burlington Northern at Grand Forks, North Dakota. It was repainted again by the Wisconsin and Southern at Horicon, Wisconsin in 2006. It was an active service on the Minnesota Transportation Museum's Osceola and St. Croix Valley Railway until the spring of 2017 when its prime mover crankshaft catastrophically failed during routine engine testing. The unit was moved into storage as BNSF and the Society worked on a long-term solution to return it to service. BNSF found a 20-cylinder prime mover from an ex-Santa Fe SD45-2 number 6470 had it rebuilt at the railroad's Topeka, Kansas shops and shipped it to Northtown. The 400 was pulled from the Northtown storage track, brought into the diesel shop, and the old prime mover was pulled out with the new one put in by the Northtown shop forces, all at no cost to the society. CSX donated SD45-2 number 8954 to the Southeastern Railway Museum. EMD built the engine in August of 1974 and it was one of only 136 SD45-2s built between 1972 and 1974 and was the last of the SD45 model developed. 
Seaboard Coastline, a CSX predecessor, bought 15 45-2s in 1974, which were passed on to the family line system and the Seaboard system before the lines consolidated into CSX in 1986. We talked about that in video T118. Link is in the description. CSX kept the 8954 in freight service until moving it to maintenance of way service around 2005. It lasted in service until 2011 when it was retired into training service at the company's Railroad Education and Development Institute facility at Tilford Yard in Atlanta, which is now closed. CSX then used the locomotive for movement training for new mechanical employees. The railroad then earmarked the engine for mechanical component changeout training before designating it as a surplus unit. Southeastern Railway Museum volunteer and former CSX mechanical trainer Kevin Wood spearheaded the donation of the 8954 and the Norfolk Southern delivered it to the museum on August 31, 2019. 8954 still has its 20-cylinder engine and with its acquisition by the Southeastern Railway Museum, Georgia's official transportation history museum, it becomes the first SD45-2 to be preserved. The Erie Lackawanna number 3607 is at the St. Louis Museum of Transportation. Restored to Erie Lackawanna colors, this unit is on static display. The Erie Lackawanna also had the STP45 which was bought for its larger fuel tank. Norfolk and Western number 1776 is a high hood unit on static display at the Virginia Museum of Transportation. Northern Pacific number 3617 is preserved at the Lake Superior Railroad Museum and is being restored to active service. Seaboard Coastline number 2024 is preserved at the Southern Appalachia Railway Museum. The class unit for SP's first SD45 order number 7457 is at the Utah State Railroad Museum in Ogden, Utah. It was renumbered from 8800 in 1982 during the rebuild. Wisconsin Central number 7525 is at the Illinois Railway Museum in operating condition. It's one of two Wisconsin Central SD45 units that was painted in an Operation Lifesaver scheme. When introduced, EMD touted the SD45 diesel as an engine that could run like a racehorse and drag like a mule. And based on its scorecard over the decades, it appears those claims were justified. And whether it was the 20-cylinder engine or the radical body design, the 45 series locomotives were square pegs that just never seemed to fit in. Some former Santa Fe SD45-2s have been rebuilt as SD40-2Rs and repainted into the new Benseth paint scheme, and Norfolk Southern has six former Erie Lackawanna SD45-2s on its roster numbered 1700 to 1705, the 1700 having been repainted into its original Erie Lackawanna paint scheme. On smaller roads, the 45s found favor on short lines like the New York, Susquehanna, and Western in New York, and the Genesee and Wyoming's Buffalo and Pittsburgh, one of which showed up in our area on the now abolished train 37T on September 21, 2018.
Okay, I hope that you enjoyed this 21st century look at a 20th century workhorse that's still holding it down in small pockets of America. If you look in the description, you'll find links to the various other videos that we referenced in this video. So make sure that you go and check those other videos out. It'll give you a better understanding of some of what you saw in this video. And one thing that I'll mention now, because I know that someone's going to mention it later, is that I didn't talk about the tunnel motors in this video. Why, you ask? Because there's a separate video in the pipeline for that. Now, while you're down in the description, hit the like button. That is, unless you didn't like the video, in which case you could hit the dislike button. But if you watched the video this far, then you obviously liked it. So take the appropriate action and hit the like button. It helps the channel out a lot when you do that. And as long as you still have the mouse in your hand, hit the subscribe button if you're not already a subscriber. According to YouTube's analytics, more than 75% of the people who watch this video are not subscribers. Weird, isn't it? So hit the subscribe button so that you can keep up with us and railroading in the 21st century. For Trains 21, call me AC.